And if you would open your Bibles to the book of Acts, chapter 19. Acts, chapter 19, we're going to be reading a number of verses. As Aaron mentioned last week, we're going to be picking up the pace a bit, uh, which is somewhat what the book does. The stories at the end of Acts are a bit longer. Um, There's some long speeches that we'll provide an overview of. Uh, I'm looking forward to some of the um, sort of dramatic events that happen at the end of this book. There's a, there's a drama to the end of Acts that is in keeping with some of the dramatic things that happened earlier on, and um, I think they're meant to inspire us by what God does for his church and to advance the gospel. But as we read in Acts chapter 19, beginning in verse 21, let's remember, as we always should, that this is God's holy inerrant, transforming, authoritative word, sufficient for us, for faith and practice, that we bring ourselves, our emotions, our circumstances, even our ways of thinking under its authority, that there is no part of our perspective that should not be humbled under the authority of God's word every time we Read it. We are, as it were, an open book to this book. So let's read this together. Acts chapter 19, verse 21 to the end of the chapter. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the Spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know... That from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. And when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, Hours, they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If, therefore, Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, 
he dismissed the assembly. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. It's very, very important to us as pastors that our preaching, our regular diet of preaching on Sunday morning, is simply drawing out and describing what is present in a passage of Scripture. Uh, And so that's our, our normal practice. Every week we just study the passage in great detail and we seek to describe what is present there. We don't come with a, 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 a sort of a set sermon and go hunting around looking for a passage that it somehow relates to it. Uh, the passage is not an illustration of our sermon. Uh, our sermon is an attempt to describe what is present in the passage. So to try to make that explicitly clear, clear I'd like you to sort of walk through this passage with me, uh, very similar to what I did when I was reading it through this week. So let's just, just look at it. What we're asking and what I ask every week when I prepare is, okay, first of all, what is the main point of this story? Why is it in the Bible? Uh, The Bible is not merely a historical record, though it is that, but it's always trying to tell us something about God, about humanity, about how we relate to God. It's trying to inform and shape our thinking. So so let's just look here. Let's see. How is this point uh, made in this particular story? And narratives are a little different than the letters and so forth because they don't come right out and tell you what the point is. They don't say, believe this about God. That's the way the letters are written. These are are stories. And so the point is made by asking, how does this story work? What's the result? What's surprising? What, what, how does it end? What's unexpected? That's the way stories work. And a lot of the Bible is stories. So we're asking the way stories work, what point do we sort of land at at the end? All right, so let's just look at it. Let's dive in and kind of examine this together. Now, the way I read it, this story basically has three parts. It has a brief beginning, talking about Paul, Then it has this lengthy, middle, kind of frightening, intense part about this mob. And then, after that takes place, there's a conclusion, which we'll read at the end. If you look down there at the beginning of chapter 20, verse 1, I think, is still attached to this story. Look down there at chapter 20, verse 1. See see its connection. It says this. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples... And after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. So you have this trip that is the beginning and end. It's kind of the bookends of this riot. That's the way the passage works. Paul says, I, I want to go on a journey to, through Macedonia to Jerusalem and Rome. Then you have this long passage about a riot. And then chapter 20, verse 1, Paul goes on his trip. And you always want to notice, I think you always want to notice uh, in the Bible and in narratives especially, when uh, there's an interruption that has um, virtually no need to be there from a literary standpoint. Here's what I mean. You could skip right from verse 22 um, down to the second part of chapter 20, verse 1. See if you could read it this way. Uh, Paul sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, and he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Chapter 20, verse 1, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. Wouldn't that flow? I mean, that would flow very smoothly. He says, I'm going to go on this trip. He sent his helpers ahead of him, probably to prepare the churches for his arrival. And then he says farewell, and then he departs. So one of the ways that God works through narrative in the Bible is providing interruptions and then sometimes doing something unexpected in those interruptions. So that's the basic kind of flow of this passage. Let's walk through it and see what, what point is being made. You have this beginning intention to go on a trip, and then you have this long riot section, and then you have Paul saying, I'm off, farewell, God be with you. What, what does that mean? What, what, is, what are those bookends saying about the effect of what happened in the middle? Well, most profoundly, they're saying it had no effect. Most profoundly, the, the, the biggest kind of view of this passage is this. For all of the violence and uproar and all of the verses describing what happened, the uncertainty, the outrage, the violence, the volume, essentially... Paul said, I'm going to go on a ministry trip, and then he did. And and in some ways, that is the point of the passage. 
In some ways, that's exactly the point. Paul said he was going to go on a ministry trip to Jerusalem and then to Rome, and that's no small thing if we look at that opening section. For, for Paul to go to Jerusalem uh, was not just stopping by to see old friends. He's not like swinging by grandma's house. To go to Jerusalem is essentially Paul reminding the churches that there is a unity between his Gentile mission and the sending church in Jerusalem, the starting church in Jerusalem. It's a sort of a, a lived-out parable of unity. So when he goes to Jerusalem, it, it, it is not simply to, to kind of say hi and, and grab the local uh, you know, cuisine. He, he's trying to make a point about the church being unified. His Gentile mission is unified to the church in Jerusalem and James and the brothers there. It's also likely that on this trip he is taking financial help from some of the other churches to Jerusalem to, again, express their unity with that poorer church in Jerusalem. So that's a big deal. It's also a big deal what he says, I must also see Rome. Again, not just a sightseeing tour. When Paul uses that word must, it almost always connects to his sense of divine calling. It's a, like a divine must it's not like, I have got to see that movie. I must see that. No. He's saying, I must. God has called me. And if we remember at the beginning of the book of Acts, God said to the apostles, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So Rome is this representative outpost of the ends of the earth for Luke and the way he writes Acts. To get to Rome is to see the gospel expand to the very center of the civilized world that we know from the book of Romans that Paul had plans to not only stop at Rome, to, to go beyond that to Spain as well. Well, so for Paul, this represents the continued expansion of the mission because of how fruitful it has been in Macedonia and Asia. This is gospel expansion language, unity with Jerusalem, and then I must see Rome, he says. And he'll do what he always does. He'll preach about Jesus. He'll go to the synagogues. He'll try to persuade his fellow Jews. He'll go to the Gentiles. He'll proclaim to them the Messiah. That's what his plan is to do. That's the opening, and then we have this massive interruption. About this time, in verse 23, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. Now, this, this riot basically begins with motivation from Demetrius. He's a silversmith. In all likelihood, he was the master of the silversmith guild. We would think of something like a union today where he's, the, he's in charge of this silversmith group. They have shared interests. They would sell uh, perhaps little figurines or models of this magnificent temple of this uh, goddess that the Ephesians worshipped, Artemis. Magnificent temple, massive, massive temple in Ephesus. It was like one of the pride points of their city that they had the temple to Artemis. People would come there to worship her. It was full of debauchery, terrible religion. But they would make these little figurines and they would sell them to people, kind of like um, idol worshiping souvenirs. All right, this was their their job. This was their career. Well, Demetrius says that Paul has persuaded, and we want, we want to notice his language here, because this passage, I've, I've mentioned this before in Acts, it's filled with irony. So if we're going to get the point, we have to get used to the fact that God likes irony. I, I think it's because the ways of the world are foolish in the eyes of the Lord, and the Lord's wisdom is foolish in the eyes of the world. And so throughout the Bible, there's irony. The, the opposite of what seems to be happening is the case. That's what irony is. So there's irony throughout here. Demetrius says that almost all of Asia has heard Paul as he has persuaded and turned a great many people saying that, listen to this, gods made with hands are not gods. Now, throughout the Bible, there's this sort of running tongue-in-cheek joke about idols and the blindness that people have in relationship to idols. Demetrius says this with a straight face. Paul is saying that gods made with hands are not gods. How dare he? What kind of person could think that something I could make could not be something I would worship? That's ridiculous. Of course it is. Of course a god can be made by a man. Of course a person can make something that then he expects to save him. 
That's what Demetrius is saying. He's saying, how dare Paul proclaim that this Jewish rabbi named Jesus who died on a cross is the real judge and creator of the world? How dare he persuade people to stop worshiping our god Artemis and stop buying these little idolatrous trinkets? How dare he intrude on our business? Our god's a big deal. We have to defend her, he says. And by the way, if we don't do this, we might lose our jobs. So there's this combination of selfish, greedy motive couched in religious protection. The irony is rich. Demetrius then says, it's possible that we'll lose our trade in verse 27 and that the temple of the great goddess Artemis, notice the irony, the great goddess Artemis might be counted as nothing and she might even be deposed of her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. Now, you, we've got to feel the irony of this speech. Demetrius is terrified that the preaching of Paul is going to render his God helpless. Do you feel the humor of that from God's perspective? That Paul's preaching that our God is in danger that our God might even be removed from her significance. Our great God, we need to protect her. Our God needs our protection, Demetrius says. We need to watch out for her. We better keep her safe. She might even be deposed. And underneath it all, you can feel the Psalm 2 mockery of what kind of God needs a silversmith to keep her safe? What kind of God needs Demetrius to make sure she doesn't stop being a God? Do you feel the, the heavenly laughter? It's just right there under the surface. And it's a major point. Demetrius is saying, oh no, Paul is saying those made with hands cannot be gods. Oh, we better stop that thinking right now. And we better protect our God because she's about to be de-godded by Paul. You got to feel the irony. They seem impressive. Their God seems magnificent. This temple was huge. But in reality, if they don't do something, she might lose all her converts. Because clearly she can't do anything about it. Profound irony. Now the riot, after being motivated, quickly escalates to chaotic rage. The men just begin shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Again, you've got to feel the irony. A, a God that needs a crowd to shout this over and over and over again, lest it perhaps not be true. Uh, one would wonder what kind of God that is. But they shout this, the city is filled with confusion, and they rush together into a theater. Now, this is not our modern-day theater. This is, a, again, a massive structure. It was said it could fit 24,000 people. So you, I think we're supposed to view this as a very large crowd. This is a mob now. The mob is furious. They grab two of Paul's friends. You notice there in verse 29, Aristarchus and Gaius, they drag him into the theater. This is becoming like a lynch mob. They drag them into the theater. This was where regular assemblies probably were held, but this is not a regular assembly. This is not a lawful assembly. This is basically a crowd full of people with a few ringleaders who are denouncing and demanding that something happen to defend their helpless God. This is what's happening. The, the mob is at a frenzy now. So the Jews, we don't know if this is Christian Jews, but it, possibly this is just Jews wanting to differentiate themselves from Paul. That could be the case. But they put this Jewish man forward, or it might be that he was a Christian. In any case, the mob, as mobs are, is not interested in being reasonable. They're not interested in any kind of reasonable explanation. They're not interested in a reasonable conversation. They have made up their mind. Christians are terrible and dangerous and must be destroyed, and we will not even listen to what you have to say. So when they find out he's a Jew, they don't even care what he has to say. They shout him down. And, and just think about the drama of this. Imagine this for a moment. Imagine uh, perhaps thousands, we don't know, a large crowd shouting for two hours hours in unison great is artemis of the ephesians can you imagine for two hours can you imagine shouting the same thing for two hours this kind of idolatrous 
pagan revelry. Imagine just shouting over and over and over and over. Imagine what it was like for these two Christian brothers standing there facing the roar of this crowd over and over again saying explicitly that their goddess is indeed great knowing that these men are being charged with maligning and undermining her greatness. The, the, the riot is at a, a fever pitch. I think that's what we're supposed to feel. Paul, it says, wants to go in, and his friends will not allow him. They're likely fearing for his life. Look, Paul, if you go in there, they are going to tear you to pieces. You can't go in there. They're at a frenzy just with your companions in there. If you go in there, you're going to be destroyed. We want to appreciate the fearlessness of Paul, though. Paul thinks when he sees a mob, it's a congregation. <laughs> Man, I didn't even have to gather them. This is fantastic. I can go in. I mean, you got to appreciate Paul. It really is true what he says in Philippians. I don't care whether I live or die. To me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. He's going to say this in, in just the next chapter. I, I don't count my life as of any value. If only I can testify to the grace of God. He's thinking, however many hundreds, thousands of people are there, he's thinking, but this is a great opportunity to tell people the truth about Jesus. And maybe a couple of them will believe. But Paul doesn't evaluate things on the basis of his own comfort and safety. That's not the basis of his decision-making. He evaluates things on the basis of gospel advance. That's the basis. His question is always, what will help the gospel advance? we got a big crowd. Let's talk to him about Jesus. He's not thinking, I might get torn to pieces. He's thinking, great, lots of people at once. He'll do the same thing in just a, a few chapters from now when he gets arrested and there's a mob basically ready to stone him. He says, can I please speak to the people? When he sees a crowd that are angry at him, he sees an opportunity to preach. He's not afraid. He wants to get people the message of the gospel and that's all he cares about. What happens to him is irrelevant. Helpful Note. Now, I think we also want to notice, what, what do we expect? We want to read our Bible like we would read a regular uh, story. Now, it is a, a divinely inspired story, but it's still a story. It's still a narrative. What do you expect at this point? This is the moment. The crowd has gathered. People are up there. Christians are charged. They're in a frenzy. They've been shouting two hours. The whole momentum of the narrative says something terrible is about to happen. Isn't it? It's like one of those scenes where you see the shouting and the screaming and the demanding and the, the frenzy. There's chaos. People are there. They don't even know why they're there, but they're just caught up in the frenzy of the mob. They, they agree, apparently, that great is Artemis. They, they don't even know what the charges are against these guys, but they'll just go along with the flow and they'll agree with whatever happens. The, the whole momentum of the narrative is towards something terrible happening. We wouldn't be surprised if the next sentence is, and they stoned them to death. They went to their homes and dragged them to pieces and impaled their families. That, that wouldn't be, that's what we seem to be expecting here. So you always want to notice in a story in the Bible, the point is usually hidden in unexpected things happening. Doesn't it strike you as unexpected? Verse 35 isn't that switch unexpected? Look down at your Bibles. This is what struck me this week. Two hours, they cried out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. You would think the next verse is, and they stoned them and beat them to pieces and put them in prison. But what does it say? And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, and he begins to give a speech. Now, the town clerk, we might think of that as sort of a lowly official. That's not the case. This is probably the CEO, the, the sort of town manager that had a link between Rome and the city government. So this is a significant official. And what makes that profound is the perhaps most significant city official puts himself between the mob and the church. Aren't you supposed to feel the surprise of this? He puts himself between the mob and the church. The first thing he says is that these guys have not done anything illegal. 
probably when he says they haven't blasphemed and they're not sacrilegious, he's speaking of illegal activities like robbing a temple or maybe publicly denouncing, explicitly denouncing Artemis. Now, obviously, Demetrius' point is Paul's message is really going to undermine uh, what we believe about Artemis. That, that's not what he's talking about. He's saying that they're not publicly sort of denouncing or robbing our temples. They're doing nothing civically illegal. You can't charge them with anything. So why are you here? You're, you're demanding and defending something that we all agree with, that the temple is in the city, that a stone fell from the sky, probably was a meteor rock, they suppose, that they turned into this grotesque image of Artemis. You're defending these things. We all agree on these things. Why are you here? And these men haven't done anything illegal. He, he basically begins defending the wrongness of trying to do anything rash towards the church. Now, as the church, this should be surprising. What is happening right now? The chief official of Ephesus is defending legal law and order. He's denouncing his own citizens and this very probably somewhat powerful uh, guy named Demetrius in defense of these two helpless Christians. And then you get to the end and the biggest surprise happens. What does it say down there? Look, look, look down there. Look down there what it says <laughs> in verse 40. Here's a shocking surprise, and it gets to the point. We really are in danger. Now, you've got to read this like a story. Isn't that the biggest surprise of all? Who's in danger? We really are in danger of what happening? Of being charged with rioting. Since... Again, chief manager, here he's saying this. There is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. The roar abruptly turns into a whimper. Like that. With a few sentences, he turns them from the outraged mob into this whimpering crowd. Oh man, Rome might think we're out of control. Rome might send the proconsul. We don't want Rome intruding in our affairs, thinking we're out of order and, and not a legal city. Oh, gosh. Well, boy, we, we should better get out of here. Come on, let's, let's go. Let's leave. Uh, do you see the contrast here? You're, you're intended to see the surprise of that. This roaring, for two hours they've been shouting, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. Hey, guys, you might be charged with writing. Oh, okay, let's go home. Do you feel that? What, what the Bible invites us to do so many times in narrative, what it invites us to see is the hand behind the surprise. That's what it invites us to see. Now, in narrative, it doesn't spell it out explicitly because in life, we don't hear it explicitly. And so it invites us to see the same thing will happen in your generation. God invites us to have faith in the hand behind the surprise. He invites us to have faith because we're not going to be told how the mob is going to end. We're not going to be told what's going to happen next. We're not going to be given a, a signature at the end of a surprising deliverance. Hey, by the way, that was me, God. We're not going to be told that. We're not going to be given that. That's where faith comes into play. So the book of Acts and many narratives in the Bible, they invite you to see what you can't see. Now, they paint it in such stark colors. The roaring mob is then sent, dismissed, almost rebuked, chastened like little children. You stop that. You stop shouting. And you know you're in danger of getting right. I mean, their own guy is telling them this. You leave these Christians alone. We're to hear a power behind this surprising ending. Who's in danger? The people who have the mob have grabbed Christians and put them in front of the assembly are now leaving fearful. 
Do you see where this is building towards a, a point that you can feel and sense, even though it's not spelled out explicitly? You can feel it. You can feel the truth of it. It's building in a direction. The narrative is building. And then we have the surprise of chapter 20, verse 1, which really is connected to this story. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell. And what did he do? The same thing he said he was going to do. He departed from Macedonia. I know it's not spelled out, but here, here's what I think. When you put all that together, the surprises, the unexpected things, what you think is going to happen and then what doesn't happen, and seeing behind the, the chastening of a mob by their own official. What, what do you see? Pop, Paul just continuing on his journey. The mob had zero effect in this case. What do you see? What's the point of all of this stuff that we're supposed to feel? What point are we supposed to drive into our minds and sense and experience. Here's, here's how I wrote it. No mob is a match for the mission of a sovereign God. Now you might write a slightly different sentence. But, but as I'm reading it, I'm looking at these surprises. And I'm looking at the sandwich of Paul says he's going to go. And then he goes. Interesting. In spite of all these verses, in spite of all this marb, in spite of all the fury of it, and then the other surprise is that the town is quieted almost as quickly as they're enraged. What are we supposed to see in all that? No mob. No mob. No evil desires or greedy desires. No false gods are a match for the mission of the sovereign God. They're not a match. They, they cannot match up to his power. And also the irony of the fact that the God who has to be defended is powerless against the God who doesn't have to be even named in what he's doing. We notice, notice if you do, there's no reference to Paul or Christians being able to say a single thing. In spite of Demetrius and this crowd shouting for two hours, the Christians say nothing in defense and protection of their God, and yet what they want is what happens. No mob is a match for the mission of the sovereign God. No mob. Now, how do we apply this? How do we apply this today? Great story. But the Bible is not just about history stories. It's about changing us right now. Every time we listen to a message, every time we open our Bibles, God intends change. He intends us to be different. He intends us to think differently, to be differently, to expect things differently. And this passage is no exception. So, three ways I think we can apply this. This truth that the mobs of this world are no match for the mission of the sovereign God. They're no match for the gospel advancing. They are no match. I think we need to apply this because I think in our culture especially, we, we are vulnerable to the fear of outrage. The fear of united opposition. The fear of, of public danger. We're vulnerable. We are, there, there's a certain uh, emotional um, fragileness about us, I think, in this day and age. We are more aware of public opinion than ever before. We focus on it in a particular way because of social media and because of the web. We're, we're, we're aware. We keep the pulse of public opinion closer to us than we ever have in history. And so we are, I think, because of that, more fragile. I was very uh, impressed and helped and, and motivated by this quote by John Piper. Author John Piper wrote this. He wrote it in the midst of a study of church history and how inspired he is by pastors and people in the past who didn't have the same kind of cultural vulnerability that he sees in himself and that we see in ourselves, I think, culturally today, even as the church. He writes this. I need very much this inspiration from another age. 
because I know that I am, in great measure, a child of my times. And one of the pervasive marks of our times is emotional fragility. I feel it as though it hung in the air we breathe. We are easily hurt. We pout and mope easily. Our happiness breaks easily. And our commitment to the church breaks easily. We are easily disheartened. And it seems we have little capacity for surviving and thriving in the face of criticism and opposition. He says, I feel as though it hangs in the air we breathe. We are like Piper. And listen, if he can say this of himself, I don't know if you know John Piper. If he can say this of himself, (laughs) uh, that's true of me. (laughs) That's definitely true of you. I don't think of him as fragile at all. But I think he's insightful of the church today compared to the church over the centuries, compared to the church in Acts. I think this is a vulnerability for us. We are vulnerable culturally in this way. And you might see in yourself some of this emotional fragility. Perhaps you could see in yourself being easily hurt, easily wounded. We pout, he says, and mope easily. We break easily. Our marriages and faith and happiness break easily. Our commitments break easily. There's this fragileness, thin-skinnedness, especially when public united criticism comes against us. We are quick to panic, I think he says, and slow to be steadfast. What do we do with that? We need to recognize there's the temptation to be scared of the mobs in this world, to be panicked when they start shouting, to perhaps Wonder about our convictions when they begin to cost us something we love. We can be tempted in this way. All of us face this temptation. And certainly, if a real mob gathered, we we would be tempted to look. Is is there any less important thing that I can compromise to avoid this pressure? We can see this temptation. We are not used to thinking that many people do not like us. We're uncomfortable with that. What do we do? What do we do to learn from this truth? To let it put steel in our spines. To put faith in our hearts. Enduring faith. Hardened faith. Strong faith. Faith that is not impressed by the shouting of a frenzied mob. Faith that is not intimidated by the demands of a culture that wants you to affirm their lifestyle. Faith that could care less if many people are shouting against you. This passage is meant to give us that kind of faith. Because we see the end of this mob, which is the same ultimate end of every mob. No mob. No mobster. No mob is a match for the advancing gospel. Three applications. How do we apply this? First of all, don't love the mob's approval. Don't love the mob's approval. Listen, if, if, we, if we spend a lot of our days cultivating um, a, a sort of earthly popularity as a major point of our life and thinking a lot about what people think about us, especially in the world, well, <laughs> if that's our constant diet, well, of, of course we're going to be weak when the mob turns on us and begins to attack because we want their approval. We spent a lot of time cultivating that. As someone who, who you know, imbibes a constant diet of hoping they're well-liked by the world is going to have a very difficult time when the world says, unless you abandon Jesus or his truth, I will hate you. 
That, that creates a, a, a real challenge in that moment. I think this is a, a severe danger for the North American evangelical church because for many decades we have a somewhat unusual, historically speaking, a somewhat unusual cultural prominence, somewhat unusual cultural impact, a, a somewhat unusual expectation of cultural influence and acceptance. Not the case in a lot of church history. But, but we have that sort of expectation. Well, if that popularity and approval and sort of center point in political power begins to be removed from us, our risk will be to hold on to that and give up whatever we have to to keep it. What do we have to get out of our platform so that we can keep a platform? But for Christians... Our platform is the Word of God. We can't drop part of it, even a small part of it. We can't drop it in order to gain and keep some political popularity or cultural prominence and power. No, no. Whether God chooses to keep us in prominence or not, to keep us in power or not, to keep us protected or not, we, we can't jeopardize our convictions in order to hold on to the approval of the mob. We can't do that. We are the church. We are not a political party. We are the church. We have our platform. It never changes. It might be somewhat accepted for some years. It might be persecuted in some years. But what we don't give up is our convictions. Don't crave the approval of the mob. I think I've thought a lot of times in terms of finances of that wonderful verse where it, it says, I believe it's in the Proverbs, uh, don't, um, how does it go? Don't, don't, don't allow my heart to increase when riches come or to be depressed when poverty comes. When, when, I think it says when riches increase, let not your heart go after them. And when riches decrease, look, don't, don't be depressed. I think the same thing could be said for, for political or cultural prominence. Look, look, if, if, if Christian values are on the rise in the culture, don't, don't let your heart get too excited. The culture is fickle. It, it's a mob led by the evil one. Don't, the, the culture is fickle. Don't let your heart get too excited about that. It's, it's probably temporary. It's a good thing. I, I'm really glad there was this reasonable town clerk. That's a good thing. But, but don't get too hopeful and excited. And if your prominence decreases, don't, don't be depressed. Don't love the world's approval. Don't love it. It's fickle. It changes quickly, abruptly. Don't love the mob's approval. This is particularly important for young Christians. So important because it's easy for Christians to be more aware of what is socially acceptable than what is true in the scriptures. It's so easy. I find that sometimes young Christians especially, and this can happen at any age, but young Christians, they are, they are passionate about biblical convictions that the culture agrees with. And they are silent about biblical convictions that the culture disagrees with. So you even see this publicly in some cases. You, you have even, even pastors at times, they are loud in proclaiming the evils of things that the culture agrees with. And I'm glad we are. That they're, they're loud, maybe, against things like sex trafficking or abuse. Loud about that. And that's good, because those things are evil. But, but what about things that the, the culture hates us for? God's word on sexuality. God's word on marriage and divorce. God's word on self-control. Oh, those are not popular things. And it's a sign of loving the world's approval when you're only loud and, and, and bold about things that the world agrees with right now. And, and you're silent and, and timid about things that the world disagrees with. Don't love the world's approval. It, it's a mob, and we don't have to be afraid of it. We don't have to cling to it because it is not a match for the advancing gospel. One day, God will dismiss every mob with a wave of his hand. Second application, don't be surprised when the mob attacks. Don't be surprised. This happened in a day. In a day. 
seems like just recently they had this marvelous moment, revival, magic books being burned, the power of Jesus being proclaimed. In a day, there's a mob and Christians are being dragged through the streets. Don't be surprised when the mob attacks. All mobs are basically the same. They're motivated by selfishness. They're energized by idolatry. They are unreasonable and chaotic, and they don't care what you have to say. All mobs are the same. And actually today, with social media, mobs can even get bigger and more global than they could back then. At least this was only an Ephesus mob. Today, you can have a global mob in a second. I was reading <laughs> this morning an article. Uh, so Chick-fil-A... Uh, which is not the church, let's just clarify that. It's just Chick-fil-A. Um, Chick-fil-A um, has, have, has a restaurant that's being opened in New York City. And there was, a, <laughs> there was an article in the New Yorker that it said, um, I feel like we're being infiltrated. <laughs> it reminds me of this passage. Listen, if you can be infiltrated by Chick-fil-A, <laughs> your defenses are pretty lame. We're being infiltrated, and went on to say, by traditional Christian perspective. Now, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, not everybody works, I don't think, as a Christian chick It's not even the church. It's just got, you know, a, a, an owner that has declared himself for, to believe in Christian values. It's not like you have to believe in Jesus to buy a sandwich there. He just, he's associated He's associated with Christian values and, and values about homosexuality that I think are true to the scriptures. It's not, this isn't some crazy, whacked-out Christian guy, as far as I know. But what's happening? What's happening? The quickness. The quick, as far as I know, uh, Chick-fil-A was fine 10 years ago. But man, they are hated today. The mayor of New York City wanted to boycott them when they first went. Why? Because they're a church? No, because somebody in their company is associated with Christian values. Don't be surprised. It happens quickly. Quickly. The mob attacks quickly. Always motivated by selfishness. Always motivated and energized by idolatry. It's unreasonable. It's chaotic. You will not have a chance to defend yourself. In many mobs, you will not have a chance to share your side of it. I have no intention of physically chopping down the temple of Artemis. Paul does not get to say that. He does not get to share his side of the story. And many Christian brothers and sisters over the uh, decades and into the future, they will not have a chance to share their side of a story. Even online, all we'll hear about is the worst presentation of how they're living out their Christian faith. Which that'll be a temptation for us. Don't be surprised when the mob attacks and don't be surprised when they paint Christians in the worst possible light. The mob mentality is natural to our culture, and it only is accelerated by the access to social media. Finally, don't fear the mob's power. Don't fear the mob's power. This is the great temptation. It is. This is the great temptation. It's to listen. Listen, these guys, Gaius and Aristarchus and Paul, they didn't know how this was going to end. For all they knew, this was going to end with a death. They didn't know the end. That's the reason we're given these things, I think, in story form. We're not told at the beginning, this is how it's going to end. We're simply told, this is what the final result will be. The gospel will advance. And if you're dedicated to the gospel and not to your comfort, then you're great with that end. If you're dedicated to your comfort more than the gospel, then the gospel advancing without your comfort is a bad thing. But if you're dedicated to the gospel, then whether your comfort is honored or not, whether you die or not at the end of this mob, the same verse will be read at the end, the gospel will go forward. Because no mob is a match for the sovereign power of our God and his gospel message of Christ crucified in weakness to save sinners from the wrath of God can penetrate the mentalities and fortresses of this world, which is a consternation to them that a message about a crucified Jew can be a ransom and rescue and reviving message for this humanity. That makes no sense to the power people of this world. But in heaven... 
all the shouts resound at the sound of his name. And his mission is unstoppable. And no mob, no mob that you face, no mob that demands you affirm their sinful lifestyle, no mob that insists that you agree with their wrong perspective, no mob that threatens you with disfellowship or uh, dis- d- d- being pushed out of the family, no, no mob, no mob is more powerful than the God you believe in. No mob is more powerful than the message we proclaim. No mob. We don't know what will happen to us. Like Paul, we say, we don't count our lives of any value. It's not precious to us. What's precious to us is this truth, that no mob is a match for the sovereign power of our God and his gospel going forward. Don't be afraid of the mob. Don't love them. Don't be surprised if they attack. And don't be afraid of them. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we delight in you. We love you. We are grateful for you. And because of that, Lord, we can agree with the psalmist. One thing we have asked for one thing we seek, that we would dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our life. Lord, thank you for this book of the Bible and passage of Scripture. Lord, it reminds us when we're in the middle of that shouting mob that there is an end coming in your timing and in your wisdom, but coming certainly and all mobs will be dismissed and only your truth will remain. We entrust ourselves to you. Lord, wherever there has been in our hearts any loving or clinging to the approval or fear of a singular mob or a frenzied mob, whatever it is, holding on to it in some way, Lord, we release that to you. Lord, cause us to see our lives as vessels for the treasure of your gospel. And conquer, Lord, the way you did here. Conquer those who seek to shout down your truth. Protect those right now facing mobs. Preserve your gospel. We know you will. In Jesus' name, amen.